to look up the words of the first song they played. It's such a calming song for many people, softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling, calling those sinner to come home. And church should be that, shouldn't it? Should be a place to come home. I spend most of my time with people that would never go to a church. And um, it's a home-like feeling to be around people that are sympathetic to your views and your way of life and supportive spiritually as well. I'd like to pray with you as we begin today. Father, I just want to ask that you would take a cracked and earthen vessel and have something important to say to everyone here. Father, help us to open up our hearts to your spirit, and may your spirit have the freedom to work in our hearts today. In your name, amen. Amen. God's hand. Our text for today, at least the one in the scripture reading, was in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6. But I'm going to read three more verses with it as w- by way of introduction to the topic of God's hand. Zechariah 13, verse 6. And one shall say to him, What are these wounds in thy hands? And he shall answer, These which I was wounded in the house of where? We're going to come back to that. Not the house of enemies, but the house of his friends. What? I don't know. It sounds like it is. Okay, I'll speak up a little louder. What kind of God would it take to allow himself to be wounded in the house of his friends? You know, many would see that as a great weakness. But I want to suggest today it's a sign of extreme strength. What do we imagine against the Lord? What he will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. Nahum 1 verse 9. Affliction, i.e. sin, will not raise up a second time. The first verse talking about Jesus' wounds in heaven. And where did you get these scars? Third verse, Habakkuk 3 verse 4. He had bright beams coming out of his side. And there was the hiding of his power. And then finally, the verse that really brought me to investigate Christianity. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. And this was the phrase that gripped me. For the former things, or in some versions, the old order of things has passed away. How? How will we ever get to a point where sin will not rise up? Affliction will not rise up a second time. Why would Jesus choose to have a remembrance of sin in the scars on his sides and his hands when he says here in in Revelation 21.4 that sorrow, crying, death, pain, former things are passed away? Why would he keep a remnant of something so sinister when he's making for all of us everything new? I want to suggest to you today, and we'll pick up on it a little later, that the reason sin or affliction will not come back is the very same reason that we can help live our lives distancing from sin today. Whatever reason God had for keeping those scars for all eternity, that same reason that will keep people for all eternity from choosing to reinvent sin again those same things can help us today. Here are a couple of promises about the hand of God. Psalm 18, verse 35. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great. Isaiah 41, verse 13. Isaiah 41, 13. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, fear not, I will help you. And Isaiah 49, 16, see, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand. 
You mean for all eternity, I'm going to be inscribed on the hands of Christ? How involved is God in the lives of people today? There was a quote I came across this week. Those who leave everything in God's hand eventually see God's hand in everything. How involved is God in the lives of people today? You know, back in Genesis chapter 2, he formed man. But it was a break from the creation week in the sense of how did he form the world, the light and the stars and the plants and the animals? By his word, by his spoken word. He just spoke it, and it was so. Let there be light, and there was light. Incidentally, do you know after the redeemed come back to this earth and we descend in the holy city of Jerusalem, the sinners are given one final chance to see that God was just in excluding them. We will get to see creation week again. We'll get to see this earth recreated. The same God that was involved in creating the world, he will give us a first-hand view. Remember, the walls of this new city are translucent. You can see through it. So no matter where you are in the city, on the wall or somewhere in the city, you can see God's hand at work. And how did he form man? After speaking the world into existence, how did he choose to form man? The dust of the earth. Yes, that's the substance, but how did he form him? With his hands. Can you? You've all known people that don't, want to, don't like to be dirty, fastidious of sorts. Can you just, this perfect world, waiting for God's perfect creation, the, the, the climax of it, and he chooses to form man out of the dust of the ground with his own hands. Why? Obviously, there's a lesson, right? God does nothing by accident. Everything he does is some sort of life lesson to help us to understand him better. Remember, we were created in whose image? In God's. So if he formed us out of the dust of the ground, what was he trying to say about himself? You know, there are a lot of people that believe that God uh, may exist or may not exist, but if he does exist, he sort of set the wheels of life in motion and then took a back seat. I was just talking to a family member this week that had something similar to say. Didn't really know if there was a God per se. Felt like there were many ways to come to God. Felt like in the end things really didn't matter. When God formed us out of the dust of the ground, he at the very least, as we read what Moses wrote in Genesis, at the very least was given us an example of how involved he is willing to be in our lives. One of the greatest curses of this culture is loneliness. And it seems so strange because there's all these different mechanisms for communicating. Facebook and Twitter, and I don't even have any of those accounts. And with all these new ways to communicate, people are more and more alone, more and more lonely. And yet God, when he formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed in the breast of life, he became a living being, Genesis 2-7. There's another verse where God's hand gave us an intimate view of him. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5 and verse 13. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke 5 and verse 13. Let me back up. Verse 11. Luke 5. Let me begin at verse 11. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Luke 5, verse 12. And it came to pass, when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who was seeing Jesus, fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, 
Thou can make me clean. It said he was what of leprosy? Full of leprosy. And if you know anything about leprosy, you know how when it uses the word full of leprosy, body parts had fallen off, and he was a grotesque figure to look at. People would climb and over themselves to get away from him. And when he gets to Jesus, he just falls down to his face, and then he says this. It's almost, you can almost hear the pity in his voice. Doesn't quite know if God wants to really be involved in his life, has somehow distanced himself from the work of creation and God forming us out of the dust of the ground. And he just says, Lord, if you will, if. He doesn't say, Lord, I know you will. Lord, if you will. Now, what does Jesus do? He reached out his hand, God's hand. He reached out his hand and he touched him. And this is what he says. I am willing, he said, be clean. And he immediately, the leprosy left him. Like the God in Genesis, he could have spoken the, the leper to be clean, but he didn't. While people were climbing over themselves and screaming in all directions to get away from this man, full of leprosy, while the Mosaic Code said that as a priest, Jesus was supposed to keep himself clean from him, Jesus broke everything and reached out and touched him. So this guy could know how involved God was willing in, to be in his life to make him whole, to make him clean. You know, there will be, come a time a little later in Jesus' life where he's nailed to the cross. And those hands that touched the leper were going to be nailed through Roman spikes and held to a beam of wood. But do you know that nothing could hold those hands back from saying, from helping one of you today? If you will, Lord, you can make me clean. Not a cross. Nothing could keep Jesus from reaching out and touching you and declaring, I am willing to be clean. Then I come to this verse. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy that it cannot hear. Isaiah 59, verse 1. So I come back to my text today in Zechariah. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I was asked a few weeks ago to speak this morning, and for a few weeks I've been kind of chewing over this phrase, Wounded in the house of his friends. It's such a strange thing to say when the earth has been made new. When sin is sinners are no more. Wounded in the house of my friends. You know, Jews, Judas would betray Jesus with what? 30 pieces. A 30, four 30 pieces of silver, but he betrayed him with a kiss in the garden and came to him. But then a little later in the crucifixion, in the, in the trial, I should say, of the crucifixion, do you know who hurt Jesus more? Peter. When Peter denied him with cursing. Stay here? Okay. You, more ways than one. Peter hurt Jesus more than Judas did. You know, it would take a lot for us to be willing or to be close enough to an enemy to let that person wash our feet. There is a, an act of vulnerability in that. You understand there's an act of intimacy where you have to almost expose yourself in a certain way of, of, of vulnerability or sensitivity to, to allow an enemy to wash your feet. Jesus did. But then he got even more vulnerable than he allowed even his friends to hurt him. You know, I was going along rather happily early this morning working on the sermon. Then it got a little bit too personal for me, a little too close to home. Ouch. That's a bit uncomfortable. When I stumbled upon this verse, I had read it before, but never had I quite seen it in the context of Zechariah. 
See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. We already read that in Isaiah 49, 16. But you know what the rest of the verse says? Your walls are continually before me. I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand, and your walls are continually before me. Walls in the Old Testament were a sense of protection. They were a necessity for the city. You couldn't survive against your enemies without them. But sometimes the very things that can be a, a, a blessing can be turned into a curse. And if you read just a little bit up above Isaiah 49, 14 and 15, the people felt that they were forsaken of God. And when you felt you are forsaken or betrayed, it is a very human thing to wall yourself off and, and kind of protect yourself, right? And he says, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands, and your walls are always before me. Do you get the contrast? He hung naked on the cross with no walls, no protection, no self-preservation, just vulnerable to save us. And at the same token, while he's engraving us on the palms of his hands, we have these walls because we don't want to fully surrender. We don't fully want to trust. We don't fully want to become vulnerable. And I go back to Zechariah, and he says, I was wounded in the house of my friends. And Jesus told the disciples, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. And if Jesus is our friend, shouldn't we want to be willing to be vulnerable to him? You know you cannot take up your cross. I just remembered I was supposed to stay still. You cannot take up your cross and follow God without being vulnerable and intimate with him. Do you understand you know, we live in a, a, a culture, um, it's kind of ironic, it's a culture of sensitivity, and yet we don't want to feel pain. We want a cross if it's gold and plaque, but not one that's heavy and splintered. And when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, he meant just that. Well, yes. But the greatest way to deny self is surrendering it to God. How can we get to what the Bible says in Revelation about the 144,000, they are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth, if we can't take up our cross and follow him? And how can we not take up our cross and follow him if we are not willing to let God be vulnerable? Let ourselves be vulnerable to him. We try to protect ourselves. We don't want to be intimate with him. We don't want to be um, hurt again. We don't want to trust implicitly. You know, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he gave one of the most dramatic declarations of trust. He first said, Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And a lot of Christians are uncomfortable with that, but he was forsaken. You know, make no mistake about it. He became sin for us, so he had to be forsaken by the Father. Even the disciples got very uncomfortable when Jesus declared that. Why have you forsaken me? Was Jesus so lacking faith? No, he was declaring a statement of fact. But what did he do next? Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. That was intimate trust. That was no walls between him and a father he could not see. That was no walls between him and a father whom he felt forsaken. You know, earlier in Isaiah 49, remember 14 15, they talked about how they felt forsaken of God. And he says, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. How can I have forsaken you? For all eternity, my son is going to have the scars of his desire to be with you on his palms and on his side. Vulnerability. Sometimes we think vulnerability is a sign of weakness. But let me read to you again in Habakkuk that I read earlier in the beginning. He had bright beams coming out of his side, and there was the strength of his power. The bright beams coming out of his sides. You know, he was pierced in the sides and in his hands, and those were the strength of his power. When you're vulnerable with God, it's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of incredible strength. We struggle with sin because we put up walls between ourselves and God. We can discuss all kinds of things about theology, 
and rightly so. We can discuss different things of faith and righteousness. And we can dissect all kinds of views on doctrines in the Bible. But when it comes down to the practical reality, when we are unwilling to surrender ourselves completely to him, when we are unwilling to let him tear down the walls between us and him, when we are unwilling to take up our cross and follow him, the one who took up his cross for us, we will never really be free from sin. That's why he has those scars. We will never have to worry about what will happen if 2,000 years or 5 million years into eternity, all of a sudden somebody else wants to do a little thing of sin. It will never happen. And if something is tempted that way, they will see the scars. They will see the, the result. We can be fooled, or, or, you know, the earth could have been fooled up until the cross of what Satan's true intentions were, but not at that point. It was fully unmasked. And for all eternity, sin will be unmasked as the cost of Jesus' scars. So, the question for you and for me today, let me read you one more verse. This is in John 20, verses 19 through 21. Then the same day that evening, before the first day of the week, then the doors were shut and the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be unto you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. How did he identify himself to the disciples? After the resurrection? After the crucifixion and coming out of the tomb? By showing the disciples his hands and his side. And then verse 21. So Jesus said to them, peace to you. As the Father sent me, I also send you. You. I'm grateful that we were able to change the closing hymn Nothing Between My Soul and the Savior. Hymn number 322 Nothing Between.
May God help us all to keep nothing between our soul and the Savior. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. And may the one who's engraved himself, grave yourselves on the palms of his hands, grant you peace today. In his name we pray. Amen.